probably the, the most effective way. As I mean, uh, you know, I, I guess I think the main thing people lurk behind is they try to state determinism in such a weak form, a watered down compatibilist form, that it starts to become difficult to argue. Um, okay, sure. I mean, determinism in the, in the broadest sense is that all events are causally determined by prior events or something like that. Did you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Um, just wondering how I'm gonna, you know, trying to put things into a nutshell. Um, well, I mean, you know, with determinism. Hmm, all right, how am I gonna approach this? Hmm. Wait, just to clarify, you'd, you'd agree that there's like some amount of like ex nihilo as well, right? Like you can have like things like the universe be an event that starts, right? Like, do you take events to necessarily have a cause? The oh. the main thing I deal with. So to give an example of someone who, in my opinion, is a strong determinist, uh, that guy Cosmic Skeptic, you know those right. guys. They like to state it, so Cosmic Skeptic's position on determinism is that every event that happens now, including your own thoughts, your own feelings, your own dreams, like things you just imagine, so every event, even down to that scale, is determined by a sequence of causes prior to it that goes back to the beginning of the universe, right? So, and, and he doesn't even consider himself a strong determinist. He considers himself a compatibilist or a watered down weak determinist. But to me, that's incredibly strong determinism. So that's actually really making the claim that you do not make decisions, that you do not even imagine things or dream things. You merely think that you do. You merely have the delusion or, you know, you, you have the misconception that you're deciding these things when in fact you're not. So, sorry, you see why I didn't want, uh, you see why I was dissatisfied with just a, a too brief uh, description term. So my position is that that is an illusion. That's a false position. However, uh, that doesn't mean that I'm a pro proponent for libertarian free will uh, on the other side. All right, but okay, so w why do you think that's a false position? I'm not necessarily disagreeing, I'm just wondering why you think that. Right, so I mean, I think it's a, a position that rests on a number of belief claims, of asserted idealistic belief claims that are, that are false. Um, so, you know, the belief that the operation of the mind is something as automated and determined by cause and effect relationships as the formation of stalagmites in a cave and this kind of thing, um, that no decisions are being made, that there's just a, a chemical sequence of cause and effect. It's an assertion of a kind of teleological belief about the, the mechanisms of the universe and, and how they work. There's sort of this series of beliefs that in effect replace a Judeo-Christian God ordering the universe like fate with a highly depersonalized and abstracted God, but that nevertheless operates like a God and like a fate, uh, unlike, say, a position that simply rejects those beliefs, uh, toto genere, so toto genere meaning rejecting the whole category, i.e. I'm not objecting the particular God in the category. I'm objecting to any agency, any type of God uh, being in that ordering, fate-creating uh, position. And then you're left with a, a different view of the universe. Uh, so yeah, that, I, I think that's a succinct uh, summation. All right, I mean, I'd have, a, I'd have a few questions there. Why can't someone be a determinist and accept some version of a Judeo-Christian God? Or does, why can't they think that they ordered up, ordered the world up in some sort of determined way like this? Okay, so maybe I misheard you, but you asked you asked why couldn't you be a determinist and believe in Judeo-Christian God? So I don't. I think that's more consistent. I think it makes sense. So if someone like someone's a devout Muslim, I think it makes sense for them to be a determinist. So I actually I don't. Uh, that's not my problem with it. The people I talk to, like here on this, they're not Muslims or they're not you know Orthodox Jews. They're people who think of themselves as secular, um, you, you know, secular atheists but who nevertheless believe in determinism in a way that, that to me resembles monotheism. But no, it, it, would be, it would be completely consistent to believe that there is really a uh, you know, supernatural, supernal, transcendental God who knows everything and plans everything and controls everything. That is compatible with determinism in my opinion. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, but so I'm still not quite clear on why the secular version is incoherent or false. 
for some reason. I mean, you're saying yeah. that sort of what determines the causal sequence resembles some sort of godlike being or something? I'm not quite clear on what you're saying. Okay, so so tease it out. I mean, this is kind of anti-Socratic method here because I'm I'm interrogating myself. But um, okay, so what is the difference between playing a record on a record player and a human being who's actually having dreams and thoughts and making things up in a conversation as, as they're going live, living in a way that's spontaneous? Um, the people who really believe in this godless determinism, this, uh, you know, atheistic determinism, they believe that there fundamentally is no difference that in the same way stalagmites and stalactites form in a cave just through a sequence of cause and effect, you know, ultimately at an, an atomic level, um, a, ke a chemistry level, that a human being is no different from a computer playing chess in accordance with a pre-written computer program. Or, I mean, again, and a computer right. disc, a hard disc spinning is not fundamentally different from a record player playing a record. You know, it's a series of, right. it's information written on a disc that spins around. Or that likewise, like a record playing, that these things are predetermined on the record that's that's playing out. So uh, again, this analogy, it just fleshes out. It just gives uh, an imagistic, it makes it easier for the mind's eye to behold what the issue is. Now, if you literally believe in a Judeo-Christian God that recorded the record or that created the computer program on the, you know, that's that's playing chess, so to speak. That's a consistent view of the world. But, but if you're an atheist, if you're, you know, basically a nihilistic atheist who doesn't look at the world that way, on what grounds, we can put it this way, what is the basis for believing that the human mind operates, and for that matter also, by the way, the monkey mind or the, you know, dolphin mind, but we're mostly concerned with human beings, uh, what is the basis for believing that the human brain operates in the same way as a record on a record player? And, and the, the problem very fundamentally being that, as you know, future events don't exist. They aren't predetermined. Um, well, and, and the operation of the human mind in this situation is, I think, really in a, in a very important way different from the formation of stalagmites and stalactites in a cave. I think it's in a very important way different from, from uh, you know, the playing record in a record player. No, sorry, I just say, just to be self-critical again, this is kind of anti-Socratic. I am criticizing myself here. Uh, but, you know, if there were evidence, if there were, like I'm not claiming there couldn't ever possibly, we could right now work through hypothetical situations where there is some evidence that the human mind really does operate like playing a record, starting a record player or something. Uh, there could be something that satisfies the, the criteria to justify that worldview. But my, my point is that there isn't. So, Right, so I think the first thing I want to make uh, clear is that there's, a, there's two questions going on here, right? I mean, it's, we, we can't equivoc equivocate between okay, we have reason to think this is false, and we don't have reason to think this is true. So you said you, we have reason to think that this atheistic determinist view is false, and then it seems to me that you've just given a reason to think that we don't have justification for it. And that's not the same thing, right? Uh, well, it, look, if someone just says to you, there's no sufficient reason to believe that Jesus Christ is a god and he's working with U aliens, UFOs, I think that's a bit insincere. Like, you know, okay, hypothetically, Jesus could arrive at a UFO, and then all of a sudden we all become believers in Jesus tomorrow. It, but it's not really sincere to say that. So, yes, we can phrase it as, hey, in the absence of evidence for Jesus being God, therefore I'm an atheist. But it's, it's a little bit insincere. In reality, I've come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is not God. <laughs> and uh, although in some hypothetical sense I'm open to evidence, uh, it's a little bit insincere to pretend that. So in, in the same way, again, I'm just being 100% honest with you, it's not really the case, like I'm sitting here waiting for evidence that what happened in my dreams last night and what I'm going to dream tomorrow is pre-recorded and plays off a record, like a record player, that it's something that's already determined and exists by this link of, uh, the linkages of cause and effect going back to the creation of the universe. My, my position really is dogmatically, and again, I'm being self-critical here. I mean, do, dogmatic isn't a good, it's not a flattering term to use for my position. I do actually dogmatically believe that what I dreamt last night and what I'm going to dream when I fall asleep tomorrow is not determined in advance by cause and effect, that it doesn't operate in the same way as a pre-recorded record or stalagmites and stalactites form in a cave. Yeah. And I'm, su I'm susceptible well, to criticism just, for that. Yeah. It just seems to me that your, your response to, okay, why do we think that determinism is, or uh, atheistic determinism is false, is your response is just, well, I dogmatically believe something else which entails that it's false. That doesn't really... Who's going to well, be satisfied okay. by that? 
you you may find it dissatisfactory, but nevertheless, Isaac asked me to clarify what my position is. So to put yeah, in fine. some one of Isaac's terms, you know, so I may be wrong, but fine. I'm, we're just saying what my position is. This is a polyaxiomatic system. And I, I would say further, it's false to believe that the universe must be monoaxiomatic in this way. So you might have noticed I'm accepting that some phenomena like stalagmites and stalactites forming in a cave may be explained entirely deterministically, right? Like you, you could, someone who's an expert in geology can look at how rainwater drains through this cave and can say, here's exactly the type of stalagmite and stalactite that's going to form in this cave over the next 10,000 years. And here's the explanation for why in the last 10,000 years, the rocks formed the way they did. No, maybe someone's going to disagree with me. So that's one axiom. That's one sphere within which the determinist worldview makes sense, right? But there's another sphere here where I'm using a different set of axioms. When I'm looking at dreams and desires and imagination, you know, within a mind and so on, where this, this set of axioms doesn't make sense. It doesn't give a coherent explanation of the universe. It doesn't work. So uh, one of the, I would That's say one I'm of the misconceptions, about. one of the misconceptions is that the whole universe must fall under one axiom as opposed to being polyaxiomatic. Sure. But, the, but when you just said there, is it that you said that worldview doesn't work, that, that uh, when applied to the determinist worldview, when applied to the lines and, and so forth. I'm asking why do we, should we think that it doesn't work? Wait, um, wouldn't that just justify your claim that this determinism is false? Right. You know, the, the creation... Okay, so in terms of falsifiability or testing or what have you, you know, you would have to have some basis for proving that what human beings doing, that what human beings can do that's random and creative and arbitrary is in fact not random and creative and arbitrary, but is determined in the same sense as the stalagmites forming the cave. So then you get into those kinds of questions scientifically. And it also say, you can talk about another set of axioms for people who are more cosmically minded. People are more interested in kind of big um, uh, cosmological questions and say, well, wait, what is the principle of cause and effect that creates pi being 3.1416 and so on? How is that? cause and effect. So there are several different axioms. There are several different sets here. There are different spheres in which these questions make sense and don't make sense. And now, again, if you really believe in the Muslim God, then sure, it can all be reconciled. No, I, you know, that has its own problems. But I mean, just in the same sense that you've asked me, well, why, why should you not believe in this uh, one fate guiding the whole universe? My objections are fundamentally the same as any atheist objecting to the, the Muslim God or the Christian God. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just not clear why. So someone, suppose someone is a, a atheistic determinist. What are you going to say to them to, to, to convince them that their view is untenable? I'm just not clear exactly what your problem with it is. If you're just going to say, well, that, that doesn't account for certain things that the mind does. And they, they'll just say, well, there's maybe things that we don't know about the mind, but it's not necessarily incompatible with it. Like, I, don't, I just don't understand what you would say that, that would convince someone who believes in atheist determinism. Oh, uh, well, uh, you know, if you bring someone in who really does believe in it, you, you'd see what the contrast is. But if you're talking to someone, so to a real debate I had that was very passionate for the other side, I talked to someone who really wanted to insist that human beings are no different from a computer playing chess. Uh, you know, with a, again, the programming is done in advance. It already exists on a disk that's rotating being read by a needle. And then you hear they're really passionately committed to, they're passionately attached to this belief or this worldview. And then, you know, you go through it step by step. You start to take apart, you start to take apart the ways in which that doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. Now, my position is nihilistic. So if you're asking what motivates me in that conversation, I'm not highly motivated because I just think the other side is uh, misleading or false or doesn't work as unworkable. But you're right. I'm not passionately motivated. Like, I'm not like a believer who's trying to convince you to convert to my religion. I don't have any motivation like that. But people on the other side 
they they sometimes do have that kind of strong motivation, which is interesting to observe in this way that they believe in this and they want other people. So, okay, one other example of people who are highly motivated, passionate to their side, and don't don't want to let go of the argument. You will talk to determinists who really think this has ethical significance, where they really believe right. ethically it's important for you to believe what they believe, so that you don't hold people accountable. Uh, for their ethics. So a common one, I've heard several times in this forum, people who insist that a child predator or a child molester, um, that they were just born this way and that ethically, causally, you know, there's this there's sort of in a sense, profoundly not responsible for their inclinations or, or decisions or what have you. So, or drug addiction, even people who really feel like those who become cocaine addicts are not accountable because after all, they're just a record playing on a record player. So those are the types of contexts in which this contrast in worldviews becomes uh, lively. Obviously, I, I wouldn't agree with any of that. You know, no, if you become a cocaine addict, in my worldview, that's very much on you. Yeah. All right, but then it just seems to me that you haven't, you don't really have a, a reason to think that these views are false. Or, I mean, let's let's suppose that I am. I mean, I lean towards some sort of determinism. It's probably what a lot of different than what people think, but um, at least with regards to our universe, I think I would lean towards B theory of time. That sounds pretty deterministic too. Um, why why should I think that humans are something different on a, on a in a causal sense than the record player of the stalagmite? I mean, oh, right, but the, the, so look, I can tell you have formal education and philosophy. So you know the burden of proof is on you to show that the record exists, that something was made in advance, right? So I mean, again, well, it's very similar to the position of the atheist. I mean, an atheist sure. may not be passionately motivated to debunk monotheism. We just say, look, I live in this world. I don't think there's any God. doesn't mean I have to go around ruining your celebration of Christmas or Eid or whatever. But, you know, you may be motivated, you may not. But if you believe there's a God, there's a burden of proof on you to prove something, some evidence that the universe was created like a, you know, like a knitted scarf that there were actually hands that created this by intention. In the absence of that, it's it's false to put it on the atheist and say, well, you have to show me evidence that this universe wasn't created by intelligent design. No, no, there has to be evidence on this side. So likewise, right, if you're on. telling me that that my dreams were actually something created in advance and determined in this in this sense, you know, I, I, again, I realize it's not quite the same as saying that a, an intelligent creator designed it and so on. What, what is going to be the evidence for that? Now, if, if you ask what's the counter evidence, sure, on an anecdotal level, you can get into talking about the arbitrariness and, again, the role of ex nihilo creation and so on, um, you know, that, 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 okay. that exists in our experience of reality subjectively or what have you, and to what extent that is and isn't reconcilable with uh, the ter determinist worldview. I would say that those discussions, if you're going to head into them, you have to accept that they're going to be of limited conclusive value in the same way that, you know, a debate with a creationist, when you discuss certain anecdotes that make it seem like the world, you know, doesn't make sense, that's never going to be, it's never going to be a slam dunk from one side or the other. Like, you know, the, the determinists say, oh, look at the banana. The banana looks completely, uh, you know, designed by an intelligent creator. And then the other side says back, well, look here, I have a whole bunch of anecdotes of things in evolution that make no sense that clearly were not designed by an intelligent creator. But it's it's never going to be a slam dunk for one side or the other. Right. So just to go back to the previous point, I mean, by stating my position, yeah, depending on the context, I may have incurred a premise. But I, that wasn't, I don't think that was my point, right? I'm, I'm, I'm asking, suppose that is my view. I mean, maybe I do lean that way. I'm asking you, because you incurred a burden of proof when you said that, that you implied that that sort of view is untenable or that it's false. I'm asking, you don't seem to think or care about providing some sort of reason to think that that's the case. Oh, I, I do. As say, I've, I've had many debates on it. So, exam for example, when you're dealing with the... Uh, when you're dealing with the ethical and legal arguments, then you get into questions like, well, would you actually in the real world exculpate someone, you know, refuse to hold someone legally accountable for the decisions on this basis or not? So I think just as, you know, monotheism isn't something you're going to debate in a vacuum, you're going to debate it as the ideas are implemented in the real world and change the real world and change people's lives. 
Um, like, you know, right, but this, this... In, in the same way, you know, the determinist worldview, it starts to become more hotly debatable when it comes off the chalkboard and when you're actually bringing it into, into the real world. How would, this impl- how would this actually change the way you live your life? And when I talk to people who are believers, then, yeah, it's, that, that sort of thing does come up. Right, but I could just say, yeah, sure, maybe if we explored that and found that my view in, entailed that there's no ground for moral responsibility or uh, anything like that, then I would say, okay, then I'll have to, I may, I may either choose to accept, uh, reject, uh, sorry, reject my first position that the generator is true and in favor of the moral principles, or I may just accept that there's no ground for the ethics and, and just keep the rest of my view intact. Right. I would say also, right, I mean, the, with, with the watered down compatibilists, you know, it gets to a point where there's nothing to debate because they've watered down the view so much. Right. But to give an example that's not too contentious, if I give you a blank canvas and I say to you, you can paint anything you want to paint, you can draw anything you want to draw. But let, let's just say hypothetically, I said, but in the next hour, you have to create a picture like for whatever, you know, whatever. It's a right. classroom assignment or something. You, you can't just leave it blank. You have to do something. And so you stand there and you come up with an idea and you make something, create something. Now, you know, would you really insist, you know, that, that this wasn't my arbitrary free choice? This wasn't something creative. This wasn't something in the realm of dreams that arises, you know, somewhat arbitrarily and somewhat randomly. Would you insist, no, there is no randomness in the universe. There's no ex nihilo creation. There's nothing that I choose that this was just playing like a record on a record player. This was something predetermined by circumstances. And if so, in what sense is that meaningful? And if so, in what sense is that falsifiable or, or provable? Now, again, some compatibilists would have the view so watered down that it becomes meaningless. There's kind of no, no debate to be had there. But a, a harder, a more serious, true believing determinist, they're going to they're gonna insist that, you know, no, the, 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 the painting was in the sense determined. Right. I mean, I don't know why compatibilism is even relevant here. We can just say, yeah, I mean, certainly the, the compatibilists will, might accept determinism, right? Even full-on determinism. Um, I don't see what's, why the, the determinists would be, have any problem with anything you just said. I mean, yeah, it's all causally determined by prior states of affairs or something like that. What's, what's the issue? Right. So this is this is why it rarely gets debated. I mean, unlike the difference between the liberals and the conservatives, it doesn't have that much real world application. But once in a while, but you I meet thought, people. But I thought you said the view is untenable or false. I mean, I'm just wondering, as if they're just uh, granting it. I, I, to, to put it very briefly, why is it untenable? I think the belief in a Judeo Christian God is untenable too. You know? Okay. So, That's fine. so I can also say when you have this, so this is something we encounter quite often in, in the vegan movement. If you meet someone who basically believes in a Judeo Christian God, but then takes away the particular features where they, they say, well, they believe in the universe. This gets quite common. You know, they really believe in a Judeo Christian God that's had the specific elements deleted that come out of that religious tradition, specific human elements. They have a more abstract, depersonalized God. In the in the same way, so so I would view that that worldview as untenable, fundamentally for the same reasons that the Judeo Christian worldview is untenable. So likewise, the determinist worldview, strong determinist worldview, I see that as untenable. You're believing in a type of fate, you're believing in a type of predetermination that I still think is untenable, even when you take away the beard, even when you take away the particular story about Moses or what have you. Yeah, it's a kind of uh, minimalist monotheism that I, I still think is untenable. Perhaps I missed it, but I'm. So, what exactly is it untenable in both cases? Uh, what exactly in both cases is untenable? Hey, look, hey, I think this has been a productive discussion at this point. Uh, Isaac said he didn't yeah. know what my position was, and you know that's good. So I'm I'm satisfied with this. I, I, it's yeah. one in the afternoon here, so I'm about to go to the gym. But I, I'm I'm not saying this to insult you, but I mean, I, as you can see, you and I don't we don't have a strong disagreement about this. I mean, you know, it was asked, "What is my position?" I say, "Well, I reject," and I, I think also you can appreciate that this doesn't make me a proponent of you know uh, free will determinism. But you know, I, I, so you know, I, I reject that side, and I see it as entailing certain certain uh, certain problems. But okay, okay, to directly answer your question, I think again to use very Isaacian terms, to use ask yourselves terms. What is it that makes it untenable? 
the insistence that the whole world is monoaxiomatic in that way. I think that's untenable. And I think you can probably already sympathize with that because we've given so many, so many examples. Why would you insist that the rules, the axioms operating in formation of stalagmites in a cave or playing a record after a record player, why would you assume, why would you assert that that's the same as what exists when people decide who they're going to vote for or decide to use cocaine or not to use cocaine or, you know, uh, or when they have a dream right, but this, or when they, when they paint on a blank the epistemic campus. problem again. But this is just the epistemic problem again. I, I think you're trying to get at, well, I mean, we don't have grounds to believe that the things are uh, monoaxiomatic, right? And maybe that's the case. Maybe the determinist has some sort of fonts. I'm not sure. But that's different from saying that the view that this is the case is just false or untenable. Unless you're saying that not having justification for it makes it false. Perhaps it makes it untenable, but right. does it make it so false? Having, but it's the same with the Christ, Judeo-Christian God. Having no justification for why there should be this God that created the world and controls your fate, that alone does make it untenable. And I think it leads to bad behaviors or bad conclusions. Uh, like cutting off half your dick, like male circumcision and so on, leads to uh, aberrant things. So in the same way, correct. I mean, the burden of proof would be on the other side. The burden of proof can't be on my side as the as the atheist or nihilist or non-believer here. So if there's right, no yeah. if there's no evidence to, to support the side, then yeah. But you, I, I mean, I, I thought you had said that it's, you think that it's false, right? I mean, not just that they don't have good evidence for it. Right, and same with same with Judeo Christian God. I'm mean, just being honest. Right, but then but then even if I grant that you've given good reasons to think that it well, even if I grant that they don't have good evidence for it, which we could debate, that doesn't get us to the view that it's false, right? I mean, we may just be agnostic about whether uh hard determinism is true. Yeah, but I think you'd accept also that would be a very weak position for a believer in Jesus to retreat to, where all they could say is, well, look, you also haven't proven that Jesus is is false. Well, yeah, right. but, you know, we come to a point. And again, that goes back to Sextus Empiricus and the very basis of not just the schedule tradition, but, you know, sure. whole European philosophy. So, yeah, if there's no reason. Anyway, look, I hope this is a productive discussion. I've tried yeah. to explain for Isaac's entertainment, you know, what my position is. But again, I'm not... You know, like I don't have anything to argue here. I mean, you, you've asked the question. It's a good question. Like, well, in what circumstances would this become debatable and so on? And it's like, no, I mean, I recognize for someone with my worldview, this isn't something that I'm going to crusade on. It's not something that would naturally going to be any point. You know, like, put it this way. I may have a real reason to try to convince you to not circumcise your children, right? But there's no obvious way in which I'd be motivated to try to convince uh, Sam Harris to not believe in determinism. Even though I have heard what Sam Harris says about determinism, I find mind-blowingly stupid. And in a sense, it seems it seems dangerous to me even, what he says about determinism in terms of a false philosophy. So there's a real public figure arguing for determinism. Right? Uh, Eisel, Destroyer is just looking for you to concede that you don't have an argument that determinism is false. Well, that would be incorrect. Come on, it's Isaac. You should you should be at a higher level than this. You're half asleep. Oh, so, sorry, if, is that no. sorry? Sorry, am I wrong, Detroit? I don't think so. I mean, you've you've given some reason to, to suspect that there may be not be good justification to think that our determinism is true. I mean, I'm willing to grant that um, for the discussion, um, but I don't think you've given uh, reason to think that either that or something else entails that hard determinism is, is, is false. Because you did, did you not say that you thought hard determinism was false earlier in the discussion? Yeah. Right. I, I think the purpose of the conversation, I mean, is to just disclose what the two sides positions are, or, or the three sides or four sides. Or yeah. yeah, and I was just wondering, I mean, you don't have to provide it for or whatever, but I'm just wondering if you think that you do have reason to think that it's false. Right. So we, we did cover that before, but as I said, I was just being honest. I think it's somewhat dishonest to say, like, I'm willing to accept that Jesus is really working with the aliens if a UFO arrives tomorrow and presents me with evidence. I think it's more honest to say, no, I really have come to the conclusion that, you know, these particular beliefs in Jesus are, are false. Now, if you say, well, where's your positive evidence? that Jesus is not uh, working with the aliens or isn't on a UFO right now or something. 
that's framing the question in such a way that it puts an absurd burden of proof on the other side. So, you know, obviously I could claim, I could claim to be agnostic or skeptical or something. I just think it's more honest to say, well, look, the reality of my position is not as open-minded as, as those, as, you know, skepticism really entails. Right, but we, okay, so we can even go from there, right? Certainly, there's some things you're agnostic on, right? And but you think it's more honest to say that you're not agnostic on this matter. Why? What yeah, again, I was criticizing myself. Go on. Well, what pushes you in the direction, at least, to think that it's false and not just be agnostic about it? I mean, we could answer that question about the Jesus case first, if you want. Why, why are you not just agnostic about that and think that it's false? I mean, I could answer that. I mean, do you have a reason? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think there's certain presuppositions there. Um, uh, well, first of all, I think that humans have a lifespan of <laughs> some uh, on this order of about 100 years, and and I think we have strong reasons to think that a person born uh, 2,000 years ago could not be alive today. I mean, that's that's some reason to think that that's false, right? So whether that's conclusive, someone could say, oh, it's a supernatural or something. Well, I still have that reason to think that it's false in the first place. So is there something akin to that in, in this case? Like, is there some fact about the world that leads you to think that hard determinism is probably not the case? Sure, I, I would Anything say that, changes. sure, I would say that I and you and most human beings have the empirical experience of making choices, making decisions, and of creativity, you know, like blank canvas creativity, and of arbitrariness and randomness in the universe. So again, real hard determinism, they don't even accept randomness. They don't even accept, in that sense, meaninglessness, right? So therefore, right. there has to be a burden of proof to overturn those things that I empirically experience, in the same sense that, like, if someone were to argue you know, the color blue really doesn't exist. It's just an illusion or misconception, whereas the other colors exist. I'd say, well, look, I'm starting off with the empirical experience of the color blue. It's something I and most people experience. So maybe we can narrow down your critique. Maybe you do have a point. Like maybe, you know, maybe there's some point, like culturally the concept of blue is somehow misleading. But the, when you're starting from something that is empirically experienced as real, to convince me that it's in fact an illusion there's a burden of proof on the other side. All right, but then couldn't the hard determinants just say, well, what exactly is it about your experience that is incompatible with hard determinism? Right, I understand. Uh, but point, point, uh, to say, uh, to right. point to an instance of randomness, for example. I mean, that's... So that's, that's been scientifically yeah. measured in laboratories. Uh, an example of scientifically proven randomness coming from the human mind is holding an upright meter stick or dowel of wood on the palm of your hand and looking up at it and balancing by the hand moving back and forth. It's been scientifically proven that the human brain generates random impulses through the nervous system in this process. It's been studied in a laboratory. So there are different examples where the human mind is actually doing things that are random. So, you know, well, yes, randomness exists. Now, on a cosmological level, people talk about the motion of atoms and stuff, but, you know, that's an example where you're actually dealing with the mind. So if you wanted to make the claim that absolutely nothing that happens in your dreams is random, well, there's a very large burden of proof. So, but again, any situation, any situation where you have something that's empirically given, and again, this goes back to sexus empiricus. This goes back to the foundation of European philosophy, right? If something is empirically experienced, you know, now it may not be real. It may be an illusion. You know, it may be an optical illusion or something. But if you if you start with that empirical experience, then there's obviously a burden of proof in convincing anyone that no, what you're experiencing empirically is not real. It's an illusion. It's delusion because this other thing is more real than it. Right. So again, phrased in that way, the nature of determinism, the mechanism of determinism, put it that way, then there's a burden of proof there to show that that is something more real than our empirical experience. Of things that was there. Okay, so I would want to ask questions about that experiment on the randomness of human cognition. Um, is this some but you realize that's not all that cognition. Actually, it's a very peculiar, it just shows that some things the mind do are random. Right, yeah, right. right. It doesn't, doesn't mean everything you're doing. Obviously, 
obviously if it happens at least once, right, then we've refuted determinism, right? Um, right, but you know also most compatibilists don't care about that. Most compatibilists don't care about randomness. They just care about, you know, humans, right. intentionals. Right, if, 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 it's, if it's random, then, then it's not really a, something you've willed. Um, uh, so, in what sense is it is is what happens in the mind random? Uh, what is it? What are they actually measuring? Is it just? Do you know any more details? About yeah, that, uh, it's just thing? randomness. It's randomness in the arithmetic sense that you know this is a series of impulses that yeah. Well, they, 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 is, is it so random in the sense that we can't predict it beforehand, or? No, it's it's in the strict arithmetic sense. So you know when when they look at uh, distribution of craters on a planet or something right. there are tests you use to say is this a random distribution of impact points or is this not random is this guided by something like a graphitic field that's shaping it so i mean there, there are purely arithmetic measurements of, of randomness right but if we're not investigating it uh say on the atomic level i mean could it not be the case that there's uh causes that we're not seeing um, right, but that's so look. You you phrased it brilliantly. That's great. So you just said, could it be that there are causes we are not seeing? Yes, there could be the Judeo-Christian God controlling everything. But if so, there's a burden of proof. So it's that's the perfect way to put it. You're, you're quite right. right. The determinist worldview would assert there are invisible or unknowable, you know, other causes that you're not seeing, right? Which is parallel to the belief in a fate or Judeo-Christian God, or even the Hindu belief in karma, some ways comes closer, right? Okay, you're right. That gambit, that assertion, that thesis can be stated like that, but then right. you get into all the problems that come. So you, again, the, the burden can't be placed on me to prove that the Hindus are wrong about karma. Like, oh, well, show me material evidence that karma doesn't order and control the universe and your fate. It can't be to put the burden on me, prove that the uh, Judeo-Christian God isn't uh, determined. Isley, you, have to, you, have to, you have to understand what Destroyer is doing. If you were just to say, I don't have an argument that it's false, but I don't believe it's true either, he wouldn't request an argument from you. You are putting the burden on yourself when you say that determinism is false. Is that where you're coming from, Destroyer? Essentially, and I think what he said is, well, okay, we have some reason to think that sort of some randomness, and that's, you know, these particular examples. Um, but all I'm saying is, well, that could be explained equally by um, a deterministic model. And it doesn't seem that the example actually gives us reason to think that your model is correct and the deterministic model is false, if they can both account for it, right? So Occam's razor. Again, well, I keep talking about Sextus Empiricus. Maybe you guys don't know Sextus. Sextus Empiricus, Occam's Razor. If you have two arguments, let's just say hypothetically they both give an equally valid explanation of what happens with a blank campus or dreaming. Mm -hmm. Even if they give equally valid explanations, if one side requires the belief in, you know, Hindu cosmology or the Judeo-Christian God or the deterministic pseudo-God, right? Okay, so one side is appealing to things that are unseen and unprovable. It has a greater burden in terms of Occam's razor, and the other side doesn't. Which side wins? You already know. No. Well, there's a few things going on here. Um... You stated it. You did a good job stating You said, well, what if there were unseen forces? What if there were secret, uh, the other term for that would be occult forces, right? That are actually determining, right? That's, that's the sure. correct way to it's phrase not really the question. Occult, right? But if you have two different accounts, one of which requires the belief in those things, and the other one doesn't. Well, fine, but that—that that is in itself well, no. the end of the argument, given that there isn't Jesus arriving in a UFO. But presumably, the determinists could just believe in things. Could just believe in you know particles in motion, obeying deterministic laws. I mean, what Correct. more are they positing to think that? Right. What extra things are they positing that would right. uh, invoke Occam's razor? I, I I think I've already explained that well enough. But I mean, again, if if you talk to determinists, how do they? It, how do they prove from their perspective that what you painted on that canvas and what you saw in your dream was predetermined in the same way that a record player is playing a, a record that was already recorded by somebody? They will well, spell out for you what, what their beliefs are, what, they, what they're insisting on, and so on, which includes the mono, monoaxiomatic view of the universe and so forth. So what is, it is what it is, and they oh, cling to that, and that's meaningful to them. But hang on. And it's not meaningful to me. I, think there, there may be some, I think there may be some good arguments there. Right. I think there may be some good arguments there, say, 
some interpretation of quantum mechanics is probably true or something like that. But that's, I think, beside the point that I'm trying to make is that it's not just that I may not have good reason to think that it's true. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering why you think it's false, right? That's, and I don't see the... Right, but I have answered your question. Razor, but but I, I you think answered. that Occam's razor work? Occam's razor works? There? But I, I have answered your question, <laughs> so it's no, fine. Yes, but, but again, from my perspective, okay, just, just on the discussion is over. We've disclosed what my position is. I've been very honest and I've been self-critical. Yeah. I haven't good. pretended anything that's not support. So but that's it, man. Uh, can I just ask the one question about Occam's Razor or no? Uh, sure, but probably other people can answer too. I mean, everyone knows Occam's Razor. Right. Well, it's not about what it is, but about how it applies here, right? I mean, if the uh, atheist deterministic theory is just that the universe is particles in motion obeying uh, deterministic laws, um, what about that theory um, would lead us to invoke Occam's razor to, to, in this case? Well, for, for example, uh, if you are actually arguing that there is no difference between um, an act of volition, which again comes up legally and ethically, between a choice, between something creative, something you decide, something you choose, and something you don't choose. So that is, again, I, I mentioned before, it's when these beliefs come into the real world. In the same sense, it's when the belief in a monotheistic God comes off the chalkboard and comes into social and political decisions. So that's when the absurdity starts to be shown. Slightly you don't see it's slightly motivated reasoning. You say the conclusions of this on the real world are the reason I'm not taking this argument. But it's not a good def defeat to the argument. No, I'm, but, but more precisely, what are the unnecessary entities that are, or postulates that are required by this deterministic theory that would be shaved off by Occam's razor? Right. So, uh, again, uh, one, it's different when you're actually debating this with someone who really believes in stuff. In what way is the human brain similar to a record on a record player or, a, or a chess playing computer playing a program off a disc? There's a huge right, burden I, of proof. So, sorry, but I'm just saying, I'm answering, I'm answering you also the question as you phrased it just two minutes ago, right? You're saying, well, you know, when is this a problem? When people insist that there is an invisible resemblance here, that this really, the mechanism really is the same as a computer or, or a record playing record player, the actual mechanisms of the human brain, including dreaming, including creativity, including decision making, they neither resemble that uh, empirically, nor even structurally, mechanistically, etiologically, when you look at the function of the human brain, right? Human brain, a bag of, you know, a bag of uh, electrochemical transmitters and so on, and signals going off in all directions. Where is the evidence that what I dreamt last night and what I dream tomorrow and the painting I'm going to paint tomorrow maybe arbitrarily and at random, that that's already recorded, that that's already determined, or that there could be a chain of causation that predetermines it. That's a huge burden of proof for the other side. Right. I'm not right. disagreeing with that. I, I, I recognize. There I recognize. Some case, I, 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 I think there actually is some case to be made there, and I think we could discuss that another time. But that's not really the crux of the issue, I don't think, right? If you're saying the theory is worse for some theoretical reason, i.e., that we should reject it based on Occam's razor or something else. Um, I'm wondering, well, why is that the case? What is it that Occam's razor recommends we shave off? Yeah, but, but again, I have already answered your question repeatedly. Uh, forgive me, I don't know if, have you answered that specific question? Yeah, I, I really genuinely think I have. I think I just answered it now. <laughs> But as far as I can tell, all you, what you've do done you want to state positively? So look, I understand. I understand you're playing devil's advocate here, but do you want to state positively what it is you're defending? Because generally, what happens with more thoughtful and intelligent determinists is that they retreat to a position of saying, and I've had them say this to me verbatim in these terms, that determinism has no impact on the world. There's no real world application. It doesn't exhibit itself in any way. That this is some invisible principle that can't can't really intersect with reality. They retreat to that point. Precisely because they know it becomes absurd as soon as they talk about any kind of real world, any any real intersection with reality as we experience it subjectively or as we measure it objectively. 
But I mean, is that your point? Is that you're asserting this is a principle that can exist on a chalkboard only and not have, you know, falsifiable real world ramifications? Uh, and again, I know you're playing devil's no. advocate. I know this isn't your personal view. I, I think it may have, uh, but it does if it is true. It, or if we're considering it, it may have real world applications. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm personally a determinist. I actually do lean towards uh, certain deterministic views, but um, I'm open to the possibility of, of non-deterministic views. I don't think that's a solid matter, for example, in physics, let alone philosophy. Um, but I, I don't see why that's an issue. I mean, okay, it may have ramifications in uh, the real world, but how does that answer the question about Occam's razor? I mean, how is that even co connected? I'm sorry, I can't help you with something that simple. I mean, I really feel like I've explained this, you know, plenty. No, but in terms of, so yeah. we have two, we have two but, theories, I mean, right? You must recognize this is an incredibly basic, incredibly stupid question you're asking. <laughs> I've already given you many, I, many instances and illustrations of how the burden of proof attends to one side versus the other, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I normally encounter okay. with people who really believe in determinism is the assertion that all reality is material reality and uh, that material reality is governed by atoms and chemistry and so on. So again, this is the mono axiomatic argument. Therefore, human intelligence or decisions or dreams or creativity can't be an exception to that. And although that's well stated in terms of the, the form of the argument, um, you know, uh, again, that really would entail a tremendous burden of proof. You would then have to really prove that because their their theory is, their philosophy is that there is no difference between, uh, you know, what the brain does and the formation of stalagmites in a cave. And we can start listing off many distinctive differences that all basically rational, uh, self-aware animals have that life really is different from inert matter like the formation of, of stalagmites, stalagmites, which can be a very long and ultimately kind of fruitless argument. But what they're doing um, uh, on a profound level is they're countering the Dark Ages view that human beings only have free will because of some kind of supernatural or transcendental soul, which, by the way, is also an argument that exists within Hinduism and Buddhism. That's also much debated there. It's not just the Dark Ages in, in Christian Europe where that's debated. And they say, well, therefore, if I look at the universe and I remove the soul, if I make it monoaxiomatic, I make it all based on atoms of chemistry, therefore, there can be no arbitrariness, no randomness, no creativity, no act of choice, no actual election or selection, right? So you can see that that's formally is appealing, but on a profound level, it's false and this makes sense. Okay, guys. All right, thanks for the discussion. Um, um, maybe someone can correct me here, but he just hang on. Where'd he go? He's a, maybe someone can correct me here, but was I missing something about Occam's razor? I mean, I, he said that, presumably, I think he said that Occam's razor suggests that we should reject, for some reason, this deterministic, deterministic view about the world. And I was just asking, okay, what, what is it about that theory, or that Occam's razor suggests we shave off. And then he just repeats his claim that the deterministic view requires some, or takes on some large burden of proof. And that just seems unrelated. I mean, we could just grant that, but what does that have to do with Occam's razor? Am I missing something? No, no, you're not missing anything. He was really wielding Occam's razor as some sort of a defeat to the argument. Well, right, yeah. But then he didn't miss show that if we actually multiply something beyond necessity or something like that, it just seemed... Well, the, the thing is, like, you were um, just asking him for a reason that determinism is false, right? And he exactly. seemed to keep replying by, in a roundabout way, just saying, we don't have a reason to think it's true. But right. the reply to that, obviously, is then, okay, well then just back off the claim that it's false and just say, I'm not convinced it's true. But then he would continue with the assertion that it's false. Maybe because he doesn't want to back off of it, so it just kind of turned into a circle well, like that. And when you asked him that, or when I asked him that, he said, uh, it would be more on he could say he's in Oscar better, but it's more honest for him to say that he thinks that it's false. Like, just in the same sense that he would think some strange theory about Jesus and aliens was false. And, I mean, I give an example why I might think that 
that analogy is supposed to be false, and I ask him, okay, there must be something about this case that is pushing you to towards thinking that it's false and not just being decided or something like that. And I still, I mean, maybe he gave something about intuitions or something. And and then when the, the example with that uh, cognition experiment and randomness, uh, which I wish he'd given me a source on that, but. And then that's where the Occam's razor came up, and I, he never really gave some flushed that idea out. So I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something, but no, no, he was just wrong on this, and he didn't give any good reason to believe it's wrong, other than the right. real life ramifications of it, which is super weird. It's like, am I wrong? Is it, isn't it motivated reasoning? Right. I don't think he misunderstood yeah. anything. <clears throat> Eisel's just like that. He uh, he just kind of goes on big tangents, never directly answers questions. Then later on, when you've asked the same question, tells you that he's answered it, and it's like, <laughs> oh no, I was trying to get an answer for the last like hour. Yeah, but I mean, I I mentioned Occam's Razor like a few times towards the end, and he kept saying he answered it, but he just answered it. But then nowhere in his the thing he just said was anything related to Occam's Razor brought up. I don't. Well, I mean, look, you could have at least made a, it clear how that really stock is. You're a true <laughs> member of AY server now. Having a debate with Eisel is kind of like it's like the induction. So, the rite of passage. <laughs> <laughs>